the no, the because I call you. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Oh my god, I have to go in like three minutes. Well, you can say hi. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, <laughs> oh yawning. There, I think we are alive. Yep. Oh. <laughs> I've been folks. sitting for so long. Oops. There we go. Hi, everyone. Hello. You Hi. know, I'm I'm a little nervous about our connection today. Same. Because I've been having problems. Have you been having problems? Yeah. For example, I disconnected from two Zoom calls. Oh, dear. Okay. But it was fine. We are going to manifest. We're going to manifest a good connection all all morning. <laughs> We will make it happen. We will call it forth. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. Yeah, no, I'm excited about our topic today because I think it's really practical stuff we can totally do and be guided by in our daily lives. Gavin is like a cat and is going to be playing with some string. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a ball of string. I get He's distracted just here to easily. say hello. Hello. Definitely please say hello. I'd love to know where, who's watching, where you are watching from. Um, and it might also actually affect some of the tips that we share today. Uh, so yeah, we'll wait for a few more people to come in and then I will start. And then I'll say hello when the f a few more people come in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll say goodbye. Yeah, because okay. I have a class. Because you have a class. It's Gavin's birthday Yes, in... uh, tomorrow actually. No. Yeah, it's at the start of my birthday. N your official birthday <laughs> is in two days. Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Jenna from Utah. Yay. Hello. Hi. And Emmy. Hello. Hello. And Nina saying hi from Bulacan. Hi. Tinood, mayong buntag. Aga Cebu. My mom is from Cebu. Bugo. Cebu. So, oh, how nice to have a Cebuana here. That makes me happy. <laughs> and you're getting happy birthday greetings, Gavin. Gavin's Thank birthday. You. He turns what? Thank you so much. Uh, I turn 11. I was about to say 10, but no, I'm 10. No, he turns 11 in two days. Yep. And, and badly, we all need a haircut. Oh, so yes, badly. We yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. Like I'm distracted. So how are you? Yes. Okay. So I think it's a good time to start. Um, yeah. Welcome everybody to our skin sites on um, skin first aid. Skin first aid. So you skin mean like first there's aid. a hospital? No. In fact, this is sort of the stuff that just happens in like at home. And the thing is that I've noticed, oh, from Guam, hi, Angel, um, from Davao, you know, on my Muntag also. So, yeah, so skin first aid, there's, I think, a lot of stuff that we see online, especially about how to treat a wound or how to treat a burn or whatever. And I think it's really Hashtag nice. Hashtag bomb is awesome. <laughs> okay. I think it's really nice to get um, input from, from actually a legitimate doctor on what's who we and what's real hint, hint. so remember <laughs> to ask your questions please early so, so that, that i can uh, make we sure we have more time to answer exactly questions. and i Gavin. have to go now because okay. it's 10 5. so usually he does this but i'll do this please don't forget to oh wait please don't forget to follow us on facebook and instagram at at vmv group uh dot vmv no, hypoallergenics, hypoallergenics. Uh, uh, um and if you want to buy products it's at to see you sweetheart uh, <laughs> VMVHypoallergenics.com for international and VMVHypoallergenics.ph for Philippines. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Bye! Okay, so all that said, um, I, the only thing I have to add is don't forget to check our blog, VMVinskin.com, because we put up so much content now and we'll be doing more. And I owe someone, a viewer, uh, a blog article on the skin microbiome and it's taken this long because there's actually new research on that so I'm going to be adding that so again today we're going to be talking about skin first aid and to me especially it's really helpful because every so often you know I'll get friends or we'll get customers asking can I really do this to a wound or an insect bite or whatever and many times the answer is you know, no, like you don't need to do that. You can do something else that's healthier, etc. So we'll be talking about burns, rashes, insect bites, cuts and wounds. When you slam your finger in a door, uh, knee scrapes, blisters from like your shoes or a tennis racket, for example, uh, a sty in the eye even. There's a nice tip my mom has had. And then when you have a huge planetoid zit, 
that happens. This tends to happen to me actually the day before a live stream. <laughs> so, and then when you have a huge planetoid zit in or near the nose, because that's actually a really great, very, very important um, tip. And then what else? Uh, self injections, because we were hearing that this is becoming a thing in teleconsultations, but also for people who have to take biologicals, there's some nice tips there and how to prevent scarring and long term damage. So I'll be going first into some BMB stuff that can be helpful. The first chair I have, uh, I, it's actually an InSkin article, which is how to ouchlessly treat a wound. So this r true story really happened. My daughter came in wailing and screaming and crying because she had slammed her finger in the middle of her cabinet door. And we all, I'm sure, have had similar experiences. Raise your hands if you know what I'm talking about. It's so painful, right? Your finger gets caught like in the middle of a door. So I knew it was just too tender and painful to wash right away. So the first thing I did and the first tip I want to share with everybody, and my mom uses this for her patients too, like Botox in the armpits, is ice. Ice is our friend. Um, not obviously raw ice, like an ice pack. So like with my daughter, what I did is I did an ice pack here and then a re here first, just under, because this was really too painful. And then when it was starting to get really nice and numb, I added another ice pack, but a, a smaller one or like a little ice cube in a napkin to sandwich it, <laughs> to get it really, really numb. And then here's another interesting tip. When I was younger, the very first thing we would do for any kind of wound was straight to soap and water, right? I didn't do that. So this was nice and numb. And what I did is I actually got some oils well, which is this puppy, right? I don't know if you, yeah, you can see that. And I drizzled it all over the wound because as you guys know, virgin coconut oil is a really fantastic broad spectrum antimicrobial. So until I could get a really thorough physical washing in there, I put the VCO on top of the lesion. And then after that, and this is sort of a nice tip I really wanted to, to demonstrate. So let's say that my wound is sort of around here, right? So I would either squeeze or if you're using a jar, I would take a huge, rather big amount of boo boo balm. Can you see how much that is? It's like a big old glob. I call it the glob and nudge. Um, and so again, if, if the wound is right about, I won't put it right like on, I won't press on the wound. It's the boo boo balm that's going sort of near the wound, right? And I just twist that off. And then I nudge the boo boo balm. I don't put pressure, I don't wipe it on the wound because it's super painful. So I sort of just nudge, nudge, nudge the tip of the boo boo balm just to get it to cover the wound. And that's what I'll bandage like this. I won't spread it, right? I won't press on it and spread like this because the poor child will, will jump through her skin. I'll leave it like a big glob and that's what I'll bandage or bandage. And then after a few hours or I say this was around noon by about 5 p.m. or something, I'll remove the bandage and check it out. And usually already by that time, you can see it healing really nicely. I have nice pictures of um, of this, maybe not this particular instance, but another instance on that vmbinskin.com blog post. Um, and then when it's already, you know, a little bit more healed, not so tender, then we'll do like a proper cleansing with like superwash or with any, honestly, any of the super skin cleansing creams because yeah, they're gentle, not the scrub, right? But either of the creams, any of our cleansing creams or superwash, and then I'll give it a good, good scrubbing. So that's kind of the first share I wanted to have. Um, and then we do have, I have another share and I'll call in my mom, but some quick reminders as Gavin said in his way, you can shop all of our stuff at vmbhypoallergenics.com internationally, vmbhypoallergenics.ph in the Philippines. Almost everything has clinically proven monolaurin and our organic first pressed, clinically published virgin coconut oil. In the USA, um, we're getting slowly getting stocks back up. I apologize, it has taken some time, but we do have 20% off now our gift cards, our e-gift cards, so that's pretty cool. And in the Philippines, we have, importantly, two of your faves back in stock. And again, in the U.S., we're really working to get those stocks back as well um, of Id Monal Orange and, and, and Armada in the Philippines. Apologies for this tube. It's, it's our personal stash, so it's kind of a mess. But these are back in stock online, and we expect to have other Armadas back in stock soon as well. 
Uh, when you purchase a Re-Everything product, you get two travel-sized Re-Everything eye serums and a reminder that our stores in the Philippines, actually, I think they're, they're going to be opening, I think, temporarily. We don't really know with all the lockdowns, but we follow what is government mandated. Um, and we offer curbside pickup. We do also sell off of Viber if you're in the Philippines. Anyone, if you'd like a teleconsultation with my mother or any doctor or nutritionist that we work with, drop us a PM or DM and we'll help make that happen. And for everywhere, if you've had a patch test and you're still having a dickens of a time trying to find a product that works, drop us a PM or email us and we can customize recommendations for you based on your particular allergens. So the last share I'm going to share before I call in my mom is another sort of thing to really have in stash at home is the Red Better um, Calm the Heck Down Bomb because, so this is interesting, huh? when I get those monster zits, I will do an immediate cold compress. My mom then likes to follow it with a warm compress. So the cold compress is to bring down the inflammation right away. The warm compress is to get blood circulating there to flush out the infection, the lesion, right? Um, on top of that, I'll put like a Red Better Spot Corrector, for example, but I'll also put Red Better Calm the Heck Down Bomb to get that redness down really, really quickly. Um, it's also fantastic for sunburns, brings down the redness really quickly, rashes, anything that's painful or itchy or super flaky. Calm the Heck Down Bomb is like a permanent in our stash. On that note, I will be calling in um, my mother, our founding dermatopathologist, Dr. Vermen Viralia Rowell, and... Hi, Ma. Hello. How are you? Don't you look lovely? Well, hello, hello. Mwah. 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 Double, Have double. Seat. Okay. Double, there. double. You're good. Double. So, okay, so um, very quickly, for those of you who maybe have not met my mom, she's kind of this huge brain who's way overqualified, really, to be doing this with me, but she does it because I beg. And mm -hmm. um, it's a little weird to get someone of her caliber. Hundreds of published studies, um, lecture around the world, a teacher here, clinician for really complex cases, hospitalized cases, but it's precisely because of that level of big braininess that I really appreciate her in these live streams and actually even more specifically for mundane things like this, yes. because this is the type of stuff that we would just Google normally and we're bombarded with 3 million and 10 different ways of doing things. And so I thought it'd be great to ask from an expert's point of view, what's really the better way to handle this stuff, Super. right? Love this. So, okay. This yeah, is, I... after all, the most common things yeah. that people come to yeah. see me with for, but they come to me when they're already very, very severe. I was just looking at my, if I may, yeah, I, yeah. I was just looking at my telephone, and there was a series of pictures of this lady with a lip dermatitis that over the past three months bloomed from what you know the the normal lip size to almost triple the size of the lower lip Poor you know thing, and yeah. it was really amazing so i want you to see next time i'll give you the the all the pictures because i asked for her permission i said no you know no identifiable marks or anything at all but i'd like to be able to share this with others about how uh lip but me, mostly the mask was the one responsible because she has a lip that juts mm -hmm. out a little bit more and so this was the one most affected and you could see the symmetry and the the way it affected the upper and then a little okay. bit more than we can anyway. get into that <laughs> go uh, ahead maybe go ahead. we'll do another live stream <laughs> on what would that be like severe derma dermatoses dermatitis from things we use during covid times We've done that. We We've could do an that. update. We can do an update, though. Let us know what you'd like to see. I tell you what, I'd like to be able to, in another live stream of mm -hmm. yours, talk about oh, the my. series of studies that we are doing on coconut oil. So we can do another update. We've done two on coconut oil. I know, oil but this already. is really exciting because this is on <laughs> okay. severe. We, you, know, you let us know what you want to see. How about that? If you want to okay. see an update on skin reactions from COVID, if you'd like to see an update on VCO and its use in infectious diseases, we can do something like that as well. But let's get to the first question that we got actually on Instagram, which is dark spots on legs. Um, actually, this is, sorry, the long question is, what is the cause of anthropod bite hypersensitivity reaction and how to avoid the dark spots after? Super question, because it's really very common. 
um, the when the mosquito, for instance, because it's the most common, but you can also get bites from fleas. What's an arthropod? Arthropod are bugs. There you go. Insects. Fancy, fancy way of saying yeah. that. So whether it's a mosquito, a flea bite, or a bite dust from... Dust mites? No, dust mites is because of their poop. Yeah, dust mites is not so much the dust the, mite actually yeah. biting. Uh, oh, bed bugs, which but there can you go. occur. Okay. They can bite, yeah. When they bite, they actually send their proboscis, you know, the little bit of a antenna from here, into your skin. So it's not just on the surface; it goes into the second like layer. A, of like the skin, a mini injection. Which right? is the reason why you will then get a red little papule with a center, yeah. you know, which signifies where the proboscis had gone through. Okay, and uh, then because it had gone through, penetrated into the second layer of their skin mm. where there are blood vessels. The vessels react. There's an inflammation around it. And so you get this little red spot of an insect bite or an arthropod bite. Now, then, because there's inflammation, if you do have a bit of brown added to your skin, you know, whether you're very, very light brown to very dark brown, that element of brown makes you more prone to development of what we call a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. In other words, your melanocytes are a little bit more active, and yeah. so they will produce that. And secondly, so that's on the top layer, on the um, epidermis, and but on the next layer where the inflammation was, there may be red blood cells that leaked out of the inflamed blood vessels, and those red cells will be able to leak out into the surrounding uh, dermis, is what it's called, and leave hemosiderin or iron pigment. So the combination of the... Hemosiderin or iron pigment? Yeah, Interesting. Okay. I mean from the red cells. Okay. Because the red cells made of hemoglobin, right? Yeah. So the hemoglobin, will, will uh, the red cell will break down because it's already out of the blood vessel, leave the hemosiderin, the iron, and so you now have a darkening of the skin, which is not just epidermal. So it's not just the derma. melanin. Mm -mm. Ah, new to mm. me. Yeah, okay. a little bit. So okay. there. And so therefore, that's why you, they last forever, right? Those bug bites. Those dark spots. Because it's a yeah. combination of those. But so the cause of that hypersensitivity reaction, it's not, it's not a, is it an IgE media? Is this an allergic reaction? It's an allergic to an reaction. insect bite. It's a real so it's allergic reaction. it's an IgE yes. mediated? No. The T cell mediated. Ah, so it's a skin reaction. Right. Okay. So it's not like a food reaction or a no. pollen reaction. Yeah. If you are hypersensitive to arthropod bites, then that is a skin hypersensitivity, a skin Correct. Al allergy Correct. to those bug bites. Right. 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 And then the hyperpigmentation that happens after is both a post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but also this iron... That's part of the post-inflammatory. I didn't know about that. Remember okay, what I told you. With the inflammation in the dermis and the blood vessels may burst, may. Then what happens is that the red cell goes out and the uh, hemosiderin goes. And that's all part of the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so our first question is from Jana in Utah. Hello. Hello, Jana. <laughs> is there an alternative that can be used for Band-Aids? Oh, girl. Uh, for those who have an allergy to the adhesive on them. Fabulous question. And it another, really is. <laughs> another difficult, difficult one. Oh, my goodness. It's very difficult. But <sighs> what you can do is you can test the different kinds of tapes that are out there and see which one you don't get react, uh, react to. I hyper-react also to adhesives. So whenever I get my blood test done, right. it, it's just pff, this big old world. Right, right. Because um, they yeah. use different kinds. So many, many of them are basically of the same kind of uh, an acrylic glue mm -hmm. or whatever, but some of them may be a little bit more rubberized than others, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, choose. And in my patients who are really very uh, sensitive to um, the practically old tapes, what I do is I teach them about some of these um, roller bandages that wrap and then wrap and then wrap on itself. Mm -hmm. One is called Koban, which I love, <laughs> because they come in a brown color, uh, lighter colors actually also, that when you put it on, it looks kind of natural, so it's it's okay. So that's it called Koban. It looks natural, but it's less, yeah. Less. Obvious. I tend to prefer going for the severe contrast, so then people know I have a bandage on. <laughs> but 
But that actually has worked. It depends. Like with my kids, with kids, you know, they're so uh, in their sleep. They just move all over the place. But I've had some success depending on where the, the thing is, mm -hmm. the gash or whatever, not using any tape whatsoever. So I'll use cotton or a gauze, right? So I'll do the whatever it is, say the boo-boo bomb and then a cotton or, or a gauze or both. And then I will wrap a wrap around it. And either I'll use a self, like a self-adhering wrap like what she was talking about, or I'll tape the wrap on itself so the tape actually doesn't touch the skin. Let me teach you a little bit more about hyperpigmentation, post-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. I told you that it's the inflammation that then follows that produces the increased melanin and pigment. So what we do normally now in, when we do surgery and remove punches of the skin, for instance, we don't use antibiotics anymore. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, passe anymore of placing a better diet, uh, excuse me, of an <laughs> antibiotic on top of the skin. Instead, what is actually used is, I like using a product uh, called aziloyl diglycinate or any of the innate immunity uh, kind of anti-inflammatory because it addresses the first inflammation response. So we, I apply this uh, on the skin a little bit. On top of that, I then apply pure petrolatum. Because petrolato, if you've ever dealt with it, it's a very thick goo. You put it on top. The purpose for that is that no oxygen goes in through that thick bl uh, blob of petrolatum. And by the way, you can wrap it up with what we talked about. And because of that, there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen to help the, uh, to stop the things that are under, being undergone naturally by our own cells. Right. You leave it to our cells to recover and to replenish and to produce yeah. a granul Unlike before, granulation yeah. tissue and all yeah. that. It does it naturally. Moist wound healing. And I tell you, within a couple of days, you look at it and you say, why is that so good already? <laughs> it's nice. So you know? sort of related to that, back in the day, how we dealt with burns, and then I have two questions here I know people want to get to, which is the darkening of the scars and permanent scars after burns. Um, and that was right. So before, we would leave wounds out open, right? Mm. And burns open to dry and heal. And now we know that the better approach is what she's talking about, which is occlusion or moist wound healing. You actually want to cover it and cover it for as long as you can really at a time to give basically all these cells time and a happy environment where they are produce a granulation tissue right and they yeah. start to just heal themselves the healing exactly. is faster it's less painful and the right. scarring is less too right when she did my <clears throat> occlusion dressing after a third degree burn that I had as a kid. Oh, well, this is fantastic. <clears throat> she really was like, my God, that's going to scar. And she wrapped it so tight that it prevented the keloid from forming. And I'm keloidal. So this is the good. back of her leg, you yeah, know, the belly calf. of the, the back. The calf. And I was thinking, no, 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 I don't want those legs to look ugly. <laughs> anyway, okay, so going first to quickly the how to prevent those um, dark scars, let's say, from from insect bites. Precisely that, by addressing the inflammation quickly. Quickly, when it happens, get the um, anti-inflammatory, not steroid, or if there's no other thing but the steroid, you can apply it once after all, put it on, and then place the petrolatum, and then wrap it, it up. up well. And, and then sunscreen yeah. after, I assume. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and if you don't have the wrap, you can repeat the application of the oil. The oil is also good to apply, mm -hmm. followed by the petrolatum. You'll, you'll be amazed at simple thing like that would do to your skin. Okay, so we have a question how to prevent permanent burn scars. That's kind of the same thing she was saying. Okay, right? if there are permanent burn scars that are flat or permanent burn scars how to that are prevent, depressed, prevent. I'll prevent. Yeah. The, oh, treat that this way. is what the burn that she was talking about as a very good example was when she was sitting uh, on a motorcycle, I think, and when uh, I got off the motorcycle, my the back, my calf mm -hmm, stuck there. to the muffler. There you go, and yeah. and burned it. So it was a second degree burn. Now, That's if awful. that's the qu second. kind of question you're talking about, where it blistered and then it got really ugly, yeah. and then it got a little bit indented or you know like a like an ulcer. So the best thing to do there is to do as little as possible, <laughs> and clean it with. I like my favorite is always for cleaning is. A simple little natural coconut oil, not even water. 
So if you like water, use the bottled water, not anything from the sink, because that's usually treated with something, okay? A little bit of water to cleanse it of any debris or whatever that are there. Then you put the coconut oil, because its purpose there is to add, you see, when you put coconut oil on the skin, it immediately breaks down mm -hmm. into its fatty acids. And its fatty acids are important for healing of the lipid bilayer of the membrane of cells. Regular and viewers. See how it's all coming together? <laughs> and cells are what make that thing heal. You want more of them. So that's what you do for cleaning. And then after that, you again put the petrolatum. And then what you do is, if it's deep or whatever, you get a big wad of sterile cotton or sterile gauze and make it into a ball and put it directly on top and then wrap it up. And the reason for that is when, for instance, it's in the arm, right you already cleaned it with a little bit of water and then the coconut oil to add to the fatty acids and then the petrolatum that's pure and then you put on maybe a piece of gauze or even better there are you can look in the drugstores like telfa they are plastic on one side mm -hmm. you know the reason for the plastic on one side like i tell you is again to avoid oxygen from the air going mm -hmm. in just allow that thing to live by itself, okay? And then you wrap it. When you wrap it, that cotton that you place in the center will give it even more pressure than the other areas that the wrap around is going to go. Beautiful. And you, yeah. what you can do is dress it once a day. If you see that it's doing well, second and third day, you can leave it alone, leave it be. As long as it's nice and clean and all, by the fifth or sixth day, you'll see a big difference in how nuts nicer it is. I was an early guinea pig for this, so, uh, you know, she would wrap it so tight, I'd get a little numb in my toes. But it was great. I have zero scarring there, and I'm colloidal, right? Is this the same sort of thing you would do for kitchen burns? Kitchen burns is the like same. Like oil that splatters, or I touch something? Right. With kitchen burns, you have oils that really stick in the skin mm. because that's what oils do so for that you really need to wipe it off very very well Ouch. cool it down mm. wipe it how, you know, how, wipe it even if it's super painful with like a cloth yeah <laughs> you, what you can do is get a towel a face towel maybe a white one and put it in the freeze uh, in the freezer and then put it on top of that it what will numb it as well as decrease the inflammation then you can then you can start cleaning it a little bit put more ice the ice will numb it a little bit so it doesn't hurt so much once you clean it off all of the oil because you don't want more of that oil to stay and hurt it by be being an irritant as well right so there do that's at least an hour of cold 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 you know like that so what i used to do and maybe it's wrong mm -hmm. is if i would get a burn like that or say even in my tongue i would try to submerge it in cold water that's a good idea oh, okay so yeah. that's an option if you get sort of an oil or a grease burn mm -hmm. cold co the cold is important right because we're trying to bring down that inflammation super quick mm -hmm. the thing is you also want to be able to get that oil out super quick mm -hmm. so this is why the idea of wiping was making me tear just hearing it, right? But maybe either getting a cold, wet towel and putting it on there might already help. Or what I do is submerge like a finger or whatever in that ice water because you don't want to give yourself hypothermia, I guess. But, you know, cold water to start. But scarless. Okay, fabulous. So we'll have frostbite, but no scars. Not a good idea. So yeah, if there's a grease um, burn, stick your, your, the finger, the affected area as much as you can in cold water. I've heard it's not a good idea to apply ice, like just ice raw ice Oh, you can get a nice directly. burn. <laughs> See? So here's the thing. Just the other day this happened. My husband was, was doing the parrilla thing and then I burned myself doing something, um, the barbecue, and I submerged with cold water. And then he gave me ice, an ice cube, and I said, you can't put raw ice on a... Well, you can't put raw ice on skin like that. And he said, why not? And I said, no, no, it'll burn. So it's true. It can burn. Okay, so I wasn't making that up. Especially if it just came from the freezer. You know, those big solid things. They put an old clad. <laughs> that hurts what as well. What does an ice burn look like? Uh, it's bread okay. as well. So then you have to treat that. So you don't want raw ice. If you're going to go for the ice just thing. bring it down the temperature. Yeah, just wrap it in something. Just so long as it's not directly ice on the skin. Because that's an issue. Okay. We have um, 
here an interesting question from JC. My daughter gets a mosquito bite, but the bump multiplies and kind of spreads even to other parts of the body. Will one bite create this effect because of hypersensitivity? And yes. Is great. Yeah, very great common. Idea. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, there are some patient, people who are really very sensitive to bites that they get a reaction to the reaction of the bite to the original bug. You know, the bite produces a reaction and there's a recall mechanism so that the body then begins to produce the antibodies and will react in other areas. So that's areas. already antibody involved. That's not any more a type 4 reaction. That's a B cell. That's a T cell. How is that a T cell if ah, the I see antibodies what you mean. are yes. involved? Right. So um, wait, wait. Are you saying it starts as a T cell mediated type 1 reaction? Right. But then... Those T cells become active in other areas as well oh. and produce the reaction. Then antibodies get involved mm -hmm. and then react to that and that's what makes it spread. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm learning more than I thought I would, actually. So, yeah, no raw ice, cold water. Um, when your skin tends to have raised scars, is there a way to prevent the scars being keloid? She talked about that, the occlusion and pressure dressing, right? Mm -hmm. And how best to care for cesarean scars? For? Cesarean. C-section. Yeah, for C-sections, these are the ones that are suprapubic, usually, right? Unless it's a complicated case of... Uh, a big baby or you know something else where they cut right from they don't below the navel anymore. over they usually the, 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 the default right. now is the bikini line they yes, call it yes usually yeah. that so with the bikini it's so much easier to take care of because it's far away from it's really a, it's not above any bones you know scars usually form very badly in areas that are above bony areas and that's why you will see scars here right some some mm -hmm. from vaccination scars for instance that, that right dates above bone. you those are 70s babies yeah. who have that that's, that's right <laughs> <laughs> okay what about oh sorry sorry, sorry. Um, did you finish that for, for yeah. cesarean section How right for cesarean section the same thing an anti-inflammatory you know place coconut oil an anti-inflammatory anti-inflammatory first then the coconut oil then the petrolatum go and then tape it well. Now there are, of course, a lot of products out there that are. Uh, and don't forget, by the way, the what I told you. There are several of those names where they make those kinds of tapes. Which one side is plaster, is plastic rather. It's a plasticated material. Cut them out into strips and put it on top. Perfect. Okay. What about uh, blisters? Mm -hmm. Depends upon what the blisters are from. Oh my gosh, Chelo, yours is vertical. I apologize. I really thought that the default now is bikini cut. I was very specific. I didn't know that. So okay. you're right. Blisters are depends upon what the cause is. It can be from an immediate cause, cause like from the burns we were just talking about. So let's say a blister from your shoe or like a tennis racket. Because if, when I was younger, I was told a new pair of shoes. Pop it, so that the liquid comes out. Now I'm hearing, don't pop it, mm -hmm. and then it just you you let it dry. Mm -hmm. But how, what's the best way to deal with a blister, like from a new shoe? If it's really a big blister mm -hmm. and uncomfortable, you have to be very good about it, though. You get a nice sterilizer like, uh, you know, an alcohol or a monolarin or mm -hmm. something like that. Clean it very, very well. Get a sterile needle, right? Don't just get the, paper, the, the, the scissors you use for clipping your nails. Get a sterile needle and cap it. And then, at the, if this is the Are blister, you really, you have to pop it using a very tiny needle. Okay. It's painless. A, a blister is painless. It's so painful. No, if you go in down into the into the base. <laughs> okay. If you go down into the base, if you just go into the blister and you know, if this is the blister, right? And this is my hand. Wait, 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 wait. This I will dig a little deeper. When I wear a shoe, okay. the reason I know a blister is forming is because it's painful. Then I look down and there's a bloody blister. Ah, not, not okay. bloody. I'm sorry. So I'm the, the bl <laughs> if that blister is, you know, sort of right on the surface of this. Okay. It hasn't gone up yet like okay. a bubble. You don't. I don't, you shouldn't because that would be painful. And the best thing to do is kill it. You know, you wrap it tightly like okay. we've been talking about. All right. But I'm talking about blisters that are thin, you know, like little like balloons or blisters, uh, bubbles there. You can actually, and they're Lance very it. uncomfortable oh. to go around with. Lance it with a very tiny gauge 30 even or 28 Because needles. we all have gauge 30 needles hanging around the house. Yeah. 
Uh, can a sewing needle work? As long as you sterilize it first. Okay. So sterilization would be what? Boiling? Uh, dip in hot boiling water or just get the isopropyl alcohol. And just wipe it very, very well mm -hmm. on all the surfaces and lance it. Lance it. Let you, and then just press gently, 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 and then it goes all the way flat. And then do everything Folks, else that you talked I about. I think it, now is the perfect time to underscore, to emphasize, if it looks like there's signs of infection, don't do this. Don't lance like a boil, right? A boil, something that has pus in it, something that looks that is very red, very inflamed, that has pus. I wouldn't suggest lancing it. No. That you need to have taken care of by a dermatologist or a doctor or the emergency room. Or sometimes it begins to pop. That's right. Yeah. So that the pus starts to come out. That's when you can do something of getting a sterile go of cleaning it up. And again, gently, gently, because it hurts. Gently allow it to come out slowly because then when that pass, that pass is going to be painful because it's stretching the skin. Mm -hmm. So by gently pressing down on it, letting the pass come out, gently, 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 and letting it come down, you will notice a big sigh of relief because the pain is much less and much less until you can... You okay. know, but there are some... Or have a doctor do it. I was going to say. <laughs> and there are, because truly, I mean, for smaller things that don't seem too bad, fine. But there are possibilities for things that look like just zits, right? They can be MRSA. Mm -hmm. They can be very boils. Oh, yeah. Oh, when it's really very inflamed, go to somebody, yeah, expert who can do that Don't mess around at home. Yeah. If it's a boil, if it looks like it's like the most monstrous zit you have ever seen in your life, mm -hmm. go see a doctor because that should be lanced properly in a sterile environment. And the doctor might ask for a culture mm -hmm. just to rule out the possib possibility of MRSA. Mm -hmm. MRSA is methicillin resistant staph Staphylococcus aureus and it's a very, it can be deadly uh, and can work fast, but not if caught early. So We were important. talking the other day with, I was talking the, yesterday with some doctors from uh, Makati Medical Center, and they were talking about the fact that because of COVID times, we are getting to see unusual bugs that mm. super infect lesions of the skin and of the lungs and of the whatever. So, you know, when it doesn't look like an ordinary boil, it's really becoming more inflamed, becoming necrotic even. That means there's areas that have become blackened and, you know, ne go and Necrotic ask is dead tissue. Yes. Okay. Because um, dead tissue will mean there may be more than the, the bacteria or the organism that is there is causing already a very wild kind of an inflammation and therefore you need to have it seen, have a doctor give the proper antibiotic mm -hmm. because it may no longer be a first generation or a second or a third yeah. or it might even be an IV injection that they were going to be giving to you. So do it, uh, what, you know, yeah. the, the earlier you go to a better. professional to a doctor to be to watch over things like that yeah, so things better. that aren't quite at that level and then i'll go to this great question over here but things that aren't quite at that level but since we're on zits uh, zits and things that look like cysts and whatever um you know when i get my flares because i have an auto-inflammatory thing i tend to get a big old like huge cyst that tends to happen at the base of my nose and sometimes inside my nose um, my daughter sometimes has gotten big cysts here. She f is the f only do doctor, really, I have ever heard tell me, you need to be super careful because the big cyst is in or near the nose. How many other people have heard this before? I'd love to know if this is common knowledge and I was the only one who didn't know it <laughs> or if you're, this is the first time you're hearing it. If you have a huge acne, like, you know, the big cysts, in or near the nose, did you know that that's actually really, really dangerous? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, because there's a thin uh, film or barrier here between this and going into the brain. So that, therefore, when there's that and uh, if it's an ordinary acne zit, which can happen, acne is basically no organism there that's bad. It's usually really just a an, an colonizer, I mean, a regular uh, organism of the body but with COVID times and the way these bugs now in our body are mutating it seems and the bad the good guys are now becoming very active mm. 
you know, once it's very inflamed and all that, see somebody who will be able to advise you properly as to what antibiotic to immediately treat it with. Yeah. So that you don't have that worry so, yeah. about it going. Uh, let, let me summarize because we also I don't do antibiotics as much anymore because it actually affects my auto-inflammatory thing, etc. Mm -hmm. So there is another technique which I'll share in a second. But I just want to make sure people are clear that yeah. So Nina's the first time her hearing that a big acne cyst in or near the nose can be dangerous. I don't know if you caught that, but basically it's because it's a very clear pathway to the brain. Mm -hmm. So if you get infected matter in this channel, mm -hmm. right, it's dicey because yeah. you have the sinuses and you have the brain and it's all kind of interconnected, correct? So she mentioned an antibiotic. I used to have to take them as soon as they came. The other thing now that we do is if it starts for me, I will, <clears throat> I'll do a cold compress to try to bring down the inflammation. I'll then do a warm compress to try to encourage circulation to flush it out naturally okay. and prevent the... But if it's already very, very big or really in there, do see someone immediately because you might need an antibiotic right away because you want to make sure that infection doesn't go up to the brain. And don't even try to puncture that, by the way. Definitely no <laughs> lancing or puncturing of acne in or near the nose, folks, for precisely that reason, okay? Um, because the doctor I was talking with yesterday was saying, there are fungus... Fungi. Fungi. Yeah. That are coming out that are really crazy. They're producing systemic infections. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, be more, be, be careful. Actually, what about styes? Like, if you get a sty in the eye, mm -hmm. do you pop it? No. What do you do? Because that hurts like mad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you uh, take a good look and try to understand why you got a sty. Have you been using oil? Have you been using an ointment? Have you been using makeup that really goes into that and you irritate the eyelid, the eyelid or the, the follicle? So what causes you know? a sty? Stop what you're doing. Is a sty actually? It's an infection. Is it like a pimple? It's like a pimple. It's like the clogging of the pore can be the cause for it. It may be something that you placed you know what, a, an eyeliner that was a little bit too sticky and clogged the pore and therefore ah, keep it. Okay, so yeah. to get rid of it is basically time. Mm -hmm. But could you also do a compress? You might uh, get, put eye drops actually with antibiotics. Some, mm -hmm. some doctors do that. And uh, so because then it will be able, to, when the tears, you know, can go and then they will bathe that area as well. And what I've done is tell patients, put it in the eye and also get a little bit and then apply it here. Okay. So that way I'm using a product that is good for the eye area in total. So, but VCO would not be a problem. VCO is non-comedogenic, so it won't Except clog, that VCO right? blurs the vision. When Temporarily, it, yes. right. But it won't cause the sty. Because no. you mentioned oils earlier, so I ah, wanted to make VCO, sure that was clear. Yes. Um, but so, yeah, the big lesson there is don't lance your sty, folks. You probably don't want to anyway because it's painful, but don't, <laughs> don't, just don't do it. Um, okay, Angeline is asking, how would you treat multiple keloid acne scars on the back and chest? that are raised and red. Um, Aderma already injected it with medicine to flatten it, but she said it's just temporary. Do you have a technique to make it go away permanently? So raised red keloidal acne scars on the back and chest. There are really combination treatments nowadays for things like that. Mm -hmm. There's even surgery, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Surgery was causing it in the first place, but there are even surgical techniques of cutting it at the base and then immediately putting in the treatments that work for stopping keloid from forming. And that would be using um, injections that are not just a steroid, but mixed with something like 5-fluorouracil, you know, which is an anti-cancer. It's not that keloid is not a cancer, but in the same mechanism of stopping growth of cells what? is the reason for why it's also injected. So things it's like fascinating that. to mm. me. Oh my gosh. So there are treatments available. And then there's also lasers that are now used. Um, my suggestion is you go to your doctor who really knows about these things because it's really a, what do you call this? It's testing it out to see which one works, mm. right? And which works combination, for you in yes, particular. Which combination of treatments that they have yeah. in their armamentarium that will work. I'll give you an example. I had a patient referred to me uh, who had a... You know, she had, she's a very nice, slim, built person. And so when she had her pregnancies and they were very big babies, um, she, you know, she had this, the, the muscle broke 
and she had what we call diastasis of the muscles. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's me. I have diastasis yeah, recti. She had, right. Yeah. She had something like that, diastasis recti, and so they had to repair that as well as the air, the, the skin on top of it. But the doctor wasn't much of a plastic surgeon and mm-hmm. didn't bother with the overlying skin. So here it is. She's already flat inside from the, all that repair, but the skin is still wrinkled like this, you know. So she asked me what's going to be done. And, I, and I, I'm not an expert on that, so I called the person I know has the most machines in our country. And he gave me ideas about it. There are several uh, machines. It's not if surgery were to be done by a very, very good plastic surgeon, they do it so finely, so meticulously, you hardly ever see the scarring, you know. I tell you, I have a doctor who did my ovarian, my, you know, where they cleaned up everything in my under, her, inside. Her ovarian cancer. You can hardly yeah. see the scar from that. And that's a recent scar. It's really fantastic. And she's 80, so, she was yeah, 81 80, at the time. 82, yeah, I was 81 at the time. Yeah. So get, go to, I, now I advise her, for me, I would advise you to just go to a really good plastic surgeon who's going to be doing that mm-hmm. and tightening the skin plastically because it can be done and you hardly see the scar. But if you're really keloidal, be sure it's a good dermatologic plastic surgeon who will attend to both the fixing yeah. of the skin wrinkling as well as to be avoiding of the keloid formation because like yeah. we talked earlier, there are ways to prevent the keloid from I think from there's forming. a nice hidden tip here for, for you guys to, to hear, uh, and certainly for Angeline. A lot of doctors really sort of at the top of their game tend to collaborate a lot more than you yes. would think. They Correct. tend to cross-consult with people from other specialties, mm-hmm. uh, especially she sees people who with real big, like either hormonal issues, cancer, HIV, whatever, whatever. And she works a lot with infectious disease doctors, Correct. Um, plastic surgeons, endocrine. pulmonary, endocrine doctors, gynecologists. Infectious disease doctors. Yeah, they're very, very collaborative. So if your case happens to be a little more complex, don't freak out. Many yeah. doctors like collaborating together. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. I hope that was helpful. Um, there was a nice question that's really, really, really relevant to me. <laughs> Joan, is it Joan or Joanne? What is the first aid for canker sores? Oh, Listen, <laughs> I'll let her answer and then I'll speak from experience. Okay. Canker sores can be just... Hi, non- Tammy from Maryland. Just come in. Hi, hi, Tammy. Uh, okay. Canker sores can be just secondary to physical factors. You bit into it, mm-hmm. right? So, or you had a, an ill-fitting whatever that you had been using. If you're an older lady, dentures, or if you're a younger one, yeah, those braces. things, yeah, the braces. Those things. So physical <laughs> factors can produce those. But then secondary factors like a secondary infection, or brushing your teeth, whatever. Mm-hmm. But then they can also be herpetic. Herpes mm-hmm. virus can produce those uh, things in the, in the mouth. So the, what I therefore do is I always look at the pattern where it is. Is it just one big one or are there several of them in a row? When they are several, you know, spots, they're usually herpes and they're usually bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. And they're usually associated with the history of having had herpes on the lip or on the eyes. You know, because herpes virus tends to cluster out around yeah. the, the more or less the same area, but not always in the same area. So going back to that uh, lady that I was talking to you at the very beginning of this the uh, live stream, yeah. the lips. Remember, I only see patients by tele. My resident will see the patient in the clinic, but this one was in a hurry on a Sunday telling me, I woke up this morning and my lips are and now three like times this, this size, three times yeah. bigger, swollen, little bubbles here and there and all of that, you know. So I said, you know, I'm going to do a double treatment on you of giving you a herpes medication as well as an antibiotic because I think there may be herpes. Then she gave me a history of having had herpes history. She said she was she had a soster mm-hmm. um, three months, four months ago. And when I look at the, when I listen to the history, it didn't sound like herpes zoster because there was no pain or very little pain. And it only lasted a week. Herpes zoster, as you people Shingles. know, will, uh, zoster will, will last for about three weeks, yeah. you know, and there's the pain. I remember it. that too. Right. So there was okay. none. And so anyway, we're, we're, it depends upon the cause. <laughs> we have about nine minutes left. So right. first, just a few things I want to double down on here. I think 
people less than before, but some people might still have the stigma of herpes as some sort of sexually transmitted disease. No. It can be, but yes. not all the time. That's right. Some you, Your fever can be herpetic, mm -hmm. right? Your blister here or, you know, those, what is it called again? <laughs> it gets dry here. Angular stomatitis. <laughs> there you go. Um, they can be herpetic. Yes. I So what I wanted to share were sort of really practical tips here, Joan. Um, so I get canker sores very much as part of my auto-inflammatory condition. My record is 100, 100 something, 120 in my mouth at one time. My last record was maybe five years ago, four, three, yeah, five years ago of 20 or so in my mouth. Very no painful, more. no more. So here's what worked for me. Um, we, did a, we did a culture, actually she did, to double check to make sure it's not herpes. Uh, and then found a funny discovery. Oh, let me tell the story. <laughs> I did a smear. I told the infectious disease doctor, I was <laughs> consulting about this, and I said, these look fungal. Mm -hmm. And she said, doctora, those are sores. They're, they're not fungal at all. So I got a smear, put on the microscope, KOH examination, we call it, and you could see this strong branching, high phase, what we call it, about fungus took a picture and sent it to her. I said, now are you convinced? He said, okay, <laughs> they're fungal. They can yeah. be fungal as well. Okay, so check it. <laughs> so for me, in terms of first aid, okay, what I really like to do, what she likes to recommend also is mm -hmm -hmm with coconut oil. Right. Because it coats the mouth. A lot of the stuff that burns for canker sores, I find just okay. irritates it and That's actually right. causes me to have more. So I don't use that burning, burning stuff. I just use VCO like this. She also now has a concoction that works very well for me. When I'm feeling one starting to start, I will gargle with and it has potassium azaloyl diglycinate, which is that strong anti-inflammatory. It has glycerin. So again, you have a bit of that coating and moisturization. It also makes it taste better and VCO, virgin coconut oil. And I will, oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> and I'll do my gratitude journal and then I'll spit it out. And really 80% of the time, it'll stop it. Another thing I have done is CBD oil. CBD is tremendously anti-inflammatory. We can't get it in our country now, but depending on where you are, if you have access to CBD oil, just a drop or two right on the lesions, fantabulous. When I've had lesions that, oh, so when eating food, a funny tip I like to share with people is to drink soda water, not a Coke, not a Sprite, not, not a soda, soda, just bubbly something, bubbly soda water, because I find it helps numb it. And I can actually, I can actually eat, at least eat, right? Um, but those are some of the things that have really been helpful. Okay, folks, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'll go to, it's a, I was going to say something else, and of course I forgot. Oh, right, Tammy, I hope the vaccination went well. She had mentioned last time that she was going to get vaccinated, and I was thrilled. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, okay, any first, oh, rashes. Rashes, rashes. I wanted to make sure I asked about that. That came up on Instagram as well. When someone gets a rash, mm -hmm. do you reach for the steroid right away? What do you do? What's a nice first aid at home for when your kid shows like they're bright red or something's itchy? What do you do? I always look look for the cause. Okay. Because if the rash is because they were wearing a new uh, hooded jacket mm. and it's the lining that they were reacting so they were getting it just around here, then I'd remove that uh, jacket and tell them never to use it again, right? And, or give it to somebody else. And then I apply an anti-inflammatory. My favorite is an anti-inflammatory which is not steroidal and there are those in the market now. One is called tacrolimus or pimecrolimus and there's that aziloyl diglycinate product that I told you about. So those, those are non-steroidal. Now if it's a very severe acute redness yeah. really then I'll use a steroid a couple of times. Especially if it's spreading, no? if it starts to look like it's right. really spreading. And there is no secondary infection. Mm -hmm. If it is with a secondary infection, I will put the steroid and already give an antibiotic, even orally right. if need be, depending upon the extent right. of it. If it's just a mild one, yeah. just apply that, put some coconut oil, put on the boob. Cold the, compress. Know, cold compress and all that. Petrolatum. And right. right. Monolaurin, right? Okay, so follow-up question, and I think this is our last question of the day, um, on the mosquito bites that look like they multiply, mm -hmm. right? So she's asking, we, you, or he, it, 
they are asking, we usually use betamethasone di dipropionate for this bite. That's a steroid. Right. Is there an alternative to treat this that is non-steroidal? Yeah, I just mentioned them, the non-steroidal yeah. are tacrolimus and pimecrolimus and the aziloyl diglycinate Potassium containing. Right. Aziloyl right. diglycinate, yeah. By the way, <laughs> there's a cute um, thing that they say. If it's cockroaches, it's usually breakfast, lunch, and dinner, so you'll have more than one. Shit. Right? <laughs> if it's arthropod bites, it's usually just one. Oh right? God. The mosquito so comes zooming three in. in a row. But breakfast, lunch, and dinner is like usually a cock. A cock. Uh, usually uh, cock. Uh, I love uh, it. Uh, <laughs> one quick thing then to share here, JC, is a lot of people, I think, still are f freaked out a bit about DEET. DEET is a fantastic yeah. insect repellent. Mm. Um, 50 the, plus years. Yeah, the 50 plus years old. The studies that were originally done on DEET that showed problems, neurological problems and all this, these were really, really old studies. They were not, if I, if I remember right, statistically relevant, right? It was or the few. severe reactions were because they were drunk. Yeah. Little babies who, I mean, kids who, you know, found it and drank, drank it. Drank the stuff. Th those were the exceptional, I know, but... Otherwise, DEET is a fantastic yeah. uh, ingredient that has 50 years plus of, of uh, use, wildly popular use, and very little reactions. It's not an allergen. Mm -hmm. It's not an irritant. It's not a neurotoxin. Don't drink it. Don't lick it. So with kids, be a little careful, especially young, young children. You don't want it in their hands where they can eat it, right? Um, Just in case you do have yeah. kids who are irritated by it, what you can do... I, you know, people don't like it, but th those mosquito <laughs> traps, you know, the, the one that... The killers. The, the killer. I mean, my, my family doesn't seem to like it, but it's really the, the best kind that... I don't mind it. I get satisfaction hearing them fry, which is awful to say, but it's the truth. <laughs> so, I just, we don't have enough of it. Okay, I will let you go. Thank you. Because it is 10.58. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Bye-bye. Okay, so I have a quick answer here to give for what is the best sunblock of VMV. And the answer is it really depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for very extreme, extreme protection outdoors, like this super crazy heat, what is up with this? Uh, and sun, like if you're running or at the beach or in and out of the water, this puppy is by far the best. It gives you, it really stays on the skin, very high protection. If you tend to be indoors and out, um, we would recommend Armada 30, 45, or 60. And then it's a matter of how severe is your melasma already. If it's not so much, it'd be 30, 45, 60, if it's already more developed. Also depends on what you like. 30 is a very light cream, 45 is more, 60 is a thicker cream. If, um, and I wish I brought it, but if hyperpigmentation is your main, main thing, and or you are very sensitive uh, skin, rosacea, hyperreactive, my son is photosensitive in the face, he's photoallergic, um, or you really have allergies to chemical sunscreens, which are more correctly called organic sunscreens, then Armada Baby or Post Procedure. They're purely mineral, purely physical sunscreens, more correctly called inorganic sunscreens. That's how I would answer that question. And then another question on the stuff to have in first aid kits. This is really pretty much my first aid kit in like when we travel and stuff. It is id gel or kid gloves that I use as a hand sanitizer. It is VCO to cleanse those wounds. Boo Boo Balm for healing. Red better if there's pain or itching or redness. Often I'll use the two of them together. So that is basically the first aid stash in our home. Um, and on that note, I will thank you guys for joining us again this week. I do hope you got some helpful tips there. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be back again next week. I don't remember what we're talking about, but let us know, please, what you would like us to do a live stream on. We really are looking for more topics because sometimes you want us to repeat something and other times you're like, no, we're good or that's too complex. I'd love to hear for sure. Um, look for us, bmbhypoallergenics.com or .ph and then follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. We're putting up videos every week now pretty much on YouTube and vmvinskin.blog for all the questions that you have. Um, so yeah, there. Be safe, everybody, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>